Welcome to another inspirational message from Chow Dean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chow Dean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. So uh, this morning we're going to have a look at, um, can you believe we're six months into the year already? Yeah, Um, it's six months since I stood here in January where we talked a little bit about our plans for church, around how we realize our vision. We had a quick update back in April and and back when I spoke then I said I would unpack things a little bit more in June and here we are, it's amazing how quickly uh, time is, is passing us by. And when we looked back in January, we noted that this was our 10th year anniversary, our 10th anniversary of Chowdian Community Church, when two churches came together um, with an audacious vision uh, to change the world. And the challenge that we set ourselves back in January was, let's see if we can shine brighter this year than we had in our 10 years previous. And it's been great just to see all of the things that have been going on in church, people just sharing things that have been going on for a long time. It's been fantastic just to hear about um, Louise Ward this morning, 27 years. Um, That's just brilliant. And we've been seeing also lots of new initiatives and new things springing up in church. Uh, We started another toddler group recently that meets on a Friday. Um, And we've also got our Monday Connect group as well, which is uh, reaching out to Um, those who are marginalized in society. And it's a great night on a Monday where we just sit down, we have food, we share testimony, uh, we sing. And it's it's just a great night and and our church is impacting on on people's lives. So we talked about this idea of the church going supernova just for this year that we try to shine brighter than we ever have done before. And the definition of a supernova is a stellar explosion that briefly outshines an entire galaxy radiating as much energy as the sun or any ordinary star is expected to emit over its lifespan. So after we set the scene back in January, we went to Seaburn, and Jeff Lucas came and spoke to us, and he just spoke um, so eloquently right into the heart of where we are at church. And he just captured something and gave us a real timely message where he unpacked the book of Acts, and he compared the supernova church to the early church in Acts. Um, where the the church exploded in the society. And he said that the church is a band of travelers that navigate change. I I just love that idea, a band of travelers that navigate change. That as church, we're always on the move. That God is drawn to a movement of people and that we move, things come up against us and we navigate them and we, we we break through. So on our journey, we've been looking at how do we move to meet people where they are? And how do we take things with us that we believe are essential in building an effective church? So if we just remind ourselves of our vision, uh, which is on the second slide. So um, our vision of a local church with a a global reach, where in Matthew 28, Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And we... um, Translated that into a a more modern language where we said, find out what God is doing and join in. And that really has been um, the heart of what what we've been trying to do at at Chowdian Community Church. And back in October, um, a number of us were really challenged when we went to the Global Leaders Conference um, at City Church. And there was a guy called Chris McChesney. Um, who was a business leader, but he he gives insight into church leaders. And he talked about this thing called execution, which sounds quite brutal, (laughs) but but it's not. It's about how we actually mobilize ourselves to execute plans because it's really, really easy to make plans. The hard thing is actually delivering these plans. And he gave us some real insight and some knowledge around how we can um, execute our plans, how we can resource um, what's really important to us. And we've taken some of those initiatives on board as we've, as we've moved forward. And in simple terms, with a little bit of planning, some courage, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, we believe that we can change the world. And that's our start point this morning. So as our start point this morning, I thought it would be good if we delve into the Book of Acts, 
um, we're just going to read together Acts chapter 4, which is a fascinating passage. It's amazing just how much stuff's going on in in that passage. So we join the scene where just after, um, after Pentecost, before the conversion of Paul, and before the church comes scattered, we have a key moment in time. And the word should appear behind me if you'd like to read. So Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who grew, who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem, and asked the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they've performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all of the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. As we read on, we see that they commit themselves to prayer um, straight after that. And I think, you know, there were some amazing key words and some amazing events just going on right there in that passage. The church was breaking through opposition and any attempts to quash its influence They were having influence at the highest level. Um, All of the the chief priests and elders and leaders were listening to the the word of God. There was visible signs of God's power, people being healed in the streets. Its members were filled with the Holy Spirit and going out challenging people. There was exponential growth, 5,000 people, no less, praising God. They prayed at every opportunity and every moment, and their prayers were so powerful that the room shook. They turned whatever situation they were in into God's glory and they displayed courage. And from there we read on and we see there's many signs and wonders. There's prison breaks, dramatic conversions of Paul, a sworn enemy of the church, turns out to be its biggest advocate. And we see the messages spread far and wide using various travel networks of the Roman Empire. And it kind of got myself to thinking, Kind of be good to be part of that church, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah? Just the buzz and the excitement of stuff that was going on. They were feeling that, that they were unbeatable. Have you ever had moments in your life where actually things just seem to slot into place and things just go really well and you're like, yes, that's great. But as we journey through the New Testament, we see that the church um, settles in various areas. Organization and order need to be brought in. Uh, appointment of elders and deacons to oversee things. And Paul, in his letters to the churches, encourages them. He gives them direction, but he also chastises them for many of them following their own way. And by the time we get to the end of the New Testament, within a single generation, and we pick up the story in Revelation, we see an interesting change. In Revelation 2, it says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. 
I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And it's amazing to see that just over a short period of time, um, what, what's happened, where God challenges them, them to say, I see the things that you did at first. I see how you pushed on through, how you persevered. But actually, the key ingredient to all of this is missing. And we need to base our church model on the early church. But the only way that we can do it and the only way that we can sustain it is to make sure that we have the key ingredient, which is love. Seasons change. Um, Things that we begin lose momentum, lose spontaneity. Life gets in the way. Life wears us down. And trying to recapture the early church is just like any relationship. We need to work at it. We really need to ask ourselves the question, how do we do church in the season that we're in and within the current, current age? So that's a, just um, a little bit of a, an intro to how we need to start thinking about how, how we do church. Let's try to capture the boldness, the courage, the enthusiasm of the early church, but let's not forget to have the thing central, the thing that really matters, which is love. So if we just move on to the next slide, just a, a quick recap of where we're at. Many of you were involved in a number of think tanks that we did at uh, the back end of last year, where we just looked at reviewing our church activities and what are the kind of things that we need to put energy into in order to make them a success. And we put our church activities on um, a seasonal graph. So things that um, towards the left-hand side are new um, and just starting off. And then as we move towards the center, things that have been taken over for a number of years and are going well, And then towards the right-hand side, things that are probably in decline that actually are really important to us and things that we we really need to get better at. So we pulled all of that together and we had a long think around how do we actually bring about a plan that helps us um, to to move forward with all of this. And I just really want to focus on, on that word that was in that first bit of text where courage is, is paramount. The courage of the disciples was there to see. And courage is often doing what you're afraid to do. There could be no courage unless you're scared. So just thinking about our model of going supernova, if we just move on to the next slide. Jeff Lucas eloquently said in January that the main characteristic of something that is supernova is that it's dying. And in order to shine brighter, And to impact more, we need to adopt the attitude of Christ, which is dying to self. In Philippians 2, it talks about Jesus, where it says, who in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And in trying to unpack all of the things around all of the different areas of church, we've been looking at this approach around how can we do the same about just humbling ourselves, putting others first, in so that we might look to scripture where it says that we will shine like stars in the sky, that we go supernova. So at the early part of the year, we looked at if there's three things that, that we can do to take our church journey forward, what are they? And we're going to talk about them this morning. So the first one is, oops, sorry, no, sorry, first one, doing church better. Go back one slide, thanks, Sean. So doing church better, what we've been looking at doing is breaking down each part and each element of church, of the things that we do, and looking to see if we can do each one of those little parts that little bit better so that on a whole, our church will resonate and glow and shine more brightly. So things like, how do we review our leadership for the next season? How should we be leading the church? Who should be leading the church forward? 
and the three senior leaders within the church have been working with a number of individuals and groups just to try to get grip to grips with that. But within this supernova model we've been looking at, in order to work effectively as a supernova church, we need to start with the core. The core, the center, is the thing that explodes and influences everything around it. So we've been talking around, how do we just get the essentials right in church? Um, We've been talking to various individuals around how we might do that. So we've been using uh, Terry and Seth as consultants um, to help us just talk through some ideas and some thoughts. And we've been breaking down every part of church to look at what is its purpose, what 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 is its vision, and what are its aims so that we can build a church that's founded on clarity, purpose, and vision. So what we want to do is we have our whole church vision, and we want all of the small parts within church, each to have their own vision and their own set of aims, so that everybody can know how they fit together in the whole church. So we started reviewing all of the different elements of church and started looking at the things that we we do. So just looking at how do we um, make sure that we have this energized core If you remember at the beginning of the year, we talked about the first thing that we were going to do was look at prayer. Let's make sure that prayer is at the center of everything that we're doing, that we're doing prayer well. And uh, we asked Sarah Motsi to have a look at that and to oversee that. And the first thing that we did was as a church, we came together to pray together for 40 days of prayer. And we want to continue that momentum going forward to make sure that prayer is interwoven into everything that we do. The second thing that we looked at was our teaching uh, and our teaching and and discipleship. So we've asked uh, Terry Nichol to uh, take over the teaching and discipleship team um, to make sure that our uh, teaching and and discipleship is challenging, empowering, and that it it, it encourages us and inspires us to look out. So Terry's actually going to give us an update as church next week. Um, So make sure you're here next week and we'll see what all of the exciting plans are around our teaching and discipleship. The other thing that we've looked at is our Sunday mornings here. And Terry used an excellent word last week when he talked about our Sunday mornings here need to be an oasis. As we are moving, as we are journeying through life, we need to have these moments where we stop and we rest, we replenish ourselves in order that we might burn more brightly. So we set up a team to have a look at our Sunday morning services. Um, So Sally... Sarah Motsi and Tim Norman went away and had a look at our Sunday mornings. What do they need to do? What purpose do they need to achieve? And the three aims that they came back with were very simple. We need to be worshipping and ministering to God, glorifying his name in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We need to be equipping and teaching each other from the word of God, prayerfully challenging and encouraging. And we need to get the message out there into the world of the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Very simple, but actually very clear on what our Sunday mornings are and what we want to do. And what we want to do is just have every element of church to know exactly um, what its role is within the wider church. So those are some of the things that we've been looking at on the activities that we do. As I say, we've started at the core. We're just trying to get the basics and the essentials of, of church right, of the things that we do. And over the course of the year, we'll start reviewing more and more of them. We've got meetings booked in with um, various different teams in church. And what we want to do is just um, really um, bring all of our different elements of church together so that we explode out into the world. So that covers the things that we do, where we said, do church better. But if we remember back to the beginning where the challenge was that we mustn't forget our first love. And that that word of love is is very important, that everything we do, we have to do in love. So the second thing that we've been looking at within church is our relationships. In Thessalonians, it says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. And as we grow and invest in our relationships, We're recognizing that as we've grown as church, that's one area that we haven't got right. Um, It's been very difficult um, to help to encourage people when actually we are the size of church that we are. When if people are struggling um, or if people are missing from church, 
it's, it's really hard to, to spot all of that. And what we want to try to do is just find a way in which we can draw all of that together. Our aim and our goal is to grow an intergenerational church. Churches often focus on particular age groups or, or demographics, if you like, and we've seen um, a number of churches do that well. But we at Chaldean believe that the local church is the answer, and the local church made up of all parts of society, young and old, can best reach out to those in need. So we need to grow an intergenerational church where the older ones pass down their wisdom onto the younger ones, and we encourage each other on this journey. If you remember back in January, we did an exercise with a tape measure, yeah, where we all got a tape measure out, um, that had a, and we, we were asked to imagine that as a timeline, and to just put a little mark where your age is, and then just to think and contemplate over how much time there was to the left, and how much time there was to the right. And some of us had more time on the left, and more experience, and some of us had a whole lifetime ahead of us. And that really is the nature of church, is that people who um, have lived life, who have wisdom and life stories, we want to pass that on to the younger generation. And in building our intergenerational church, we want to really focus on our younger families. Why is that? Well, we've already heard this morning um, in Kath's presentation about safe families around just some of the pressures that families are under every day. And I would say that families now have more pressures on them now than they've ever done before. If you think about how society has changed over the years, um, nine to five jobs are actually a thing of rarity now. It's very rare that people go to work at nine on a Monday and then finish at five on a Friday. Um, the digital world means that people are always in contact. So um, people who are on, off work or on holiday, you might often get an email or a phone call, and actually you have to just drop everything, and, and it's expected. The younger generation are sandwiched between looking after older parents, because society is living longer, and children as well. People are becoming grandparents younger, and actually it's really hard to get onto the housing market now. So you'll find now that you have um, generations of families all living un under one roof. Church is countercultural, so actually families um, and their friends will often be doing things on a Sunday. So there'll be kids' clubs on, there'll be various things going on in society. People will be meeting and socializing on a Sunday, so it's really hard to get to church. Families are bringing up our future leaders, future leaders of our country, future leaders of our church. And doing all that, they're actually balancing work shifts, family, um, and on top of that, it's more than likely that these guys are probably serving in church as well. And when one person within a family serves in church, what happens is it puts pressure on the other one who has to look after the kids. Um, and what we want to do is, that seems quite far from an oasis. Uh, and we, what we want to do is really invest in our younger families and, and make church a place where they can grow, that they can feel relaxed, and where they can come um, and just rest in Jesus. But of course, the issue is, is that people can't get to church every week now. Many people are working, or people are, have other things that just means that the people can't make it every week. And within that, it's really easy just to get lost if you're struggling. So within that, we're working on um, a pastoral care program that'll help us to draw all of this together. So um, every week at church, we ask people to sign your contact cards and um, just make sure that you keep us up to date with your addresses and your contact details. Because what we're able to do with all of that information is just map out where everybody is um, in church. And as we've looked um, at, at our system recently, it's good to see that we're actually um, in a period of growth, which is good in terms of people who are part of our church family. We've had some new faces who've joined us over the last year or so, which is great to see. But the truth is that we're probably about 15% smaller than we were two years ago. Um, in 2015, we had about 165 people within our church family. So that's not just people who come on a Sunday morning, people who are part of our church family. And now we're around about 140. 
which is way above what many churches have. And the fact that we can meet safely here on a Sunday morning is a luxury that many churches overseas don't have. But these numbers in our situation require doing church differently. And one of the real interesting trends that we've seen is, is that those within our church who were under 60 represented two-thirds of our church um, over two years ago. And now that's actually around about a half. So the truth is that we've actually lost a number of younger families within our fellowship. And within my um, first three months of my role here within church, I've actually been out meeting with younger families in church, just trying to see things through their eyes to say, tell me about your typical week and tell me how, how being part of a church fits in with that. Tell me the pressures that you're under and how that we can help. And what I've also done, which has been actually quite difficult to hear, is I've actually met up with some of the families who've left church because I think it's important for us to actually bless people um, where they're at and to um, end things well if people choose that they don't want to be um, part of the Chaldean family anymore. But actually, if we can spot where we've gone wrong in the past and where some of the signs were and how we um, didn't quite get things right, it enables us to help us think around how we can put things in place to change that. And at the end of the day, it all boils down to relationships, relationships with one another, that when we were a small family um, church where everybody knew everybody, it was quite easy um, for stuff to get done and also to spot if people were struggling or spot if people were having a difficult time. And I think some of the things that we've noticed um, is that people have really been struggling and we haven't known about it until a little bit later on. And our pastoral care program that we are working at putting in place, we hope um, to see if we can develop and grow our relationships through them. So in January, we also talked about the fact that we wanted to have some paid roles within church. Paid roles that would help to supplement some of the areas that we really want to invest in. So just to update you um, on those is that um, my role within that was a part-time role working for um, 20 hours a month for 12 months to help see if we can bring all of this together. And that started in April. And we've been working on two other roles as well, just working on um, some job descriptions and actually just working through all the, all the legal side of things because there's quite a lot of things that we need to take into account. But two roles that we want to bring into church which are specifically relevant to younger families is that we want to bring in um, a paid creche worker for a Sunday morning who works to help families just to church to be that oasis on a Sunday morning. We've spoken to several people about that and some of the people that we've spoken to haven't been quite right, um, but we're hopeful um, that we'll um, be, be able to find somebody soon in that respect. And the second thing is that we want to have a paid worker of a family worker somebody whose role it is um, primarily to give pastoral care to our families, to get to know them, um, meet with them during the week, um, look at things like um, putting on kids clubs and messy church, um, just specifically for parents with, with, with children, but also being able to feed into the children's work as, as well and just find a way that we can bring and harness those families and, and bring them together. So those are two roles that, that, that we're looking at within church. So the third thing that we are working on, if we just go to the next slide, John, is communicate. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp or put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And as church, we need to position ourselves as that light on the hill. Our tone of voice needs to include how we communicate with the world out there, but also how we communicate with each other too. And that is a real challenge in today's society with our intergenerational church because depending on our social circles, we all communicate in different ways, yeah? And I've met with various other church leaders as well, um, from um, Bethany at Sunderland, All Saints, and uh, St. George's as well. And one of the real challenges that all churches have is around communicating, because 
Now people use their own little different communication platforms depending on their social circles. So many people will be using social media, social messenger, Twitter, Snapchat. Um, some people will be using text, email, letter, landline. Um, and if you say to somebody, oh, I'll text you later, it's like, oh, I don't read text, can you Snapchat me instead? And you're like, and it's a real challenge for us as, as church when everybody is communicating um, in different ways. And I saw a really um, in, interesting um, text the other week where somebody had uh, texted their, um, their son, what do you want from life? I was like, well, that's a bit random. That's a bit out of the blue. What do I want from life? And he's like, mm, I'm going to have to have a think about that one before I reply back. And then a text came straight after within a couple of minutes saying, sorry, autocorrect. What do you want from little? <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there, haven't we, where we send something. And it's like, did I just send that? Autocorrect? But many, many, many things... Um, that this digital generation has brought is that things often get lost in translation. You know, the Bible talked about um, very early on um, when um, God's people were building a tower in Babel and all of a sudden everybody started speaking different languages. And since then, we've had to overcome language barriers. And we have a very real barrier today, and um, particularly with um, an intergenerational church, because I don't want to say, but them young ones are talking a different language altogether, aren't they? <laughs> yeah? Emojis, yeah? All, all of that kind of stuff. But the fascinating thing is, is that, you know, when social media and that first, first came out, is that, you know, people used to share a hug or, you know, send pictures of their breakfast and stuff like that. But now it is a real force of nature because whether we like it or not, elections, referendums, and the future direction of the world is being influenced by digital and social media. We've, we've seen pretty much how the outcome of the last general election, um, what was actually thought was going to be one way, and was, was actually very interesting to watch. And those of you that are on social media will have seen just how effective the, um, social media was um, in doing that. And as church, um, we need to be at the heart of that. We need to be talking to people in that language, and that's a real challenge for us. And you know that the country's seen some terrible events over the last few weeks in Manchester and in London. And it was fascinating to see what happened because within minutes of the events happening, even before news crews and emergency teams were able to arrive on the scene, people were uploading videos, sharing stories on Twitter, Facebook. Um, hashtags were started immediately. And um, there was a, a momentum of people who were conversing with each other on social media and offering help even before the emergency services were there. People were tweeting about, if anybody is in this area and you need a room to stay, get in touch with me. And actually what happened is the community mobilized into action and, and it was fascinating to see. And our challenge is that church, we need to be in amongst that generation and we, and we need to be ministering to those people. So um, just some of the things that we've um, got planned coming up um, in order to do that, if we look at the next slide, John, um, we're doing a little bit of work around how we communicate ourselves to the outside world. So we're doing a bit of a rebrand of our church and our website because actually people's first interaction with any kind of church will be via online and via the website. So what we want to do is to make sure that we're communicating who we are um, well so we're looking at um, new logo design and, and a new website for that as well. So just quickly to talk about a couple of the other things that are um, heading towards us this year. Next slide. We've got um, an alpha course starting. That was one of the things that came out of the think tank that um, we hadn't been doing uh, recently, and we want to um, start that up again. So we've got an alpha launch night on the 17th of July. And following the 17th of July, we will have two alpha groups running. One will be on a Monday night and one will be on a Wednesday night. So if you've got anybody interested in being part of alpha, um, please see us afterwards. But at the alpha launch night in July, we've got a guy called Shane Taylor who's coming to give his testimony. And you can read it there. Shane Taylor was once classed as one of the most dangerous prisoners in Britain. He tried alpha and got his life changed. Got questions about life. Try Alpha. So we've got Shane coming on the 17th of July, which is um, a Monday night very soon. So it'll be great to see you all there. Um, something else that's happening towards the end of the year, just go to the next slide. Um, yay. 
So for our Christmas carol service, we're going to do a nativity. Um, so we've got, we've got the script. It's very funny. So for a nativity, of course, we need characters. Yep, so we'll be... <laughs> so we're, there's one. So we'll be coming to see you soon uh, about characters for our, for our nativity play. 17th of December. Uh, make sure you put that in, the, in your diary. Can we believe we're talking about Christmas when it's uh, big and heat in June? But uh, yeah, we have our nativity in December. Our church weekend... 19th to the 21st of January. Just really want to encourage you to come along to that. Paul and Priscilla Reed are um, former pastors of a church in Belfast, and they're very passionate about building this intergenerational church. And we've also got a mystery guest coming. So somebody who's been under wraps for a long time. We can actually reveal now who they are. If you just press through, John, it should open up. Yay! So we have Robin Mark coming to lead worship for us. Robin Mark was the worship pastor at the time Paul and Priscilla Reed were pastor in their church. Robin Mark, you may be familiar with the name, some of the songs that he's written. These are the days of Elijah, faithful one, so unchanging. Um, He is going to be leading our worship um, over that weekend as well. So we're going to be in for um, a fantastic weekend. So I encourage you all to sign up for that. Okay. Um, just go on to the next slide. Just to wrap up with things now, thank you for being patient and thank you um, for listening. Just to bring it back to the start, I've shared some of the initiatives and some of the things that we're looking to do at church. And I guess just a word of warning that at the end of it, we're not going to have a perfect church. (laughs) So things that get on your nerves now likely still will in the future. Um, But You know, Jesus talks about forsaking all others. Um, And we're an imperfect people. We have hang-ups. We have hurts. But God has called us to journey together and to bring something different um, to his church. Just getting back to that word courage. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to your courage. How big um, is, is your world? And I'll just put that verse from Psalm 42 on there that says... As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. I'd just like to ask the music group if they want to come back up as I'm wrapping up now. And I just really wanted to just bring us back to the beginning there around, as we think around actually how hungry are we for God this morning and for the things of his church like they were in the early church. And that's, this is a, a verse that I've been thinking on a lot recently, just like, what must it be like to be so parched that you're absolutely desperate for a drink, and then you find that drink, and it, it, quenches, it quenches you and, um, and makes you feel better, and that our journey with the Lord should be the same way. But the reality is, is that if we look at that scale that we've looked at this morning, where the passion, the energy, the boldness of the early church towards the end where actually there was things a bit missing and and things were a little bit harder, is that as individuals, we could be anywhere on that scale this morning. You could be right in the middle of slaying giants where life is good, or you could be in the point where you haven't even got the energy to get out of bed in the morning. And I've been in both places. And as a community, um, we're traveling sometimes at a different pace to each other, And the important thing that as community is that we stop and that we wait. We wait for each other if people are struggling and we wait on God, our great healer. So I just wanted to say this morning that if you're in that place, Jesus says, come to me, all who are thirsty and all who are weak, and I will give you rest. Okay, guys. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.